Memories are stored in uh, different networks. So there's, there's different networks of neurons. And it depends on the type of memory you're talking about. The bit that's associated with, for example, visual memory will be stored in the visual part of the brain and it'll link then to a verbal part and these networks create connections. So it's very complicated. It's not, it doesn't sit in a little box in one neuron and if you lose that neuron, you lose that memory completely. If you think about having a mem yeah, one cell being one memory, we don't have enough cells for that. So it's gotta be the connections between those cells. Uh, which, which are very, very high numbers of connections between cells, such that if you lose one cell, it doesn't really affect our network. We've made a tremendous progress in even understanding the bits of the brain that, that tell us where memory is. So, so prior to the 1940s and 50s, we didn't even know what, which part of the brain was involved in memory. And actually that information came from studies where patients who were suffering from a particular disease, sometimes, for example, the most famous patient was HM, who was a, who was a epileptic, severe epilepsy, and they removed his part of his brain, the temporal lobe it's called, and that affected his memory. So therefore the link was made between temporal lobe memory, and actually that's now proven to be true. The belief is, or the understanding would be that memory works by changes and connections between brain cells, the neurons, which allow a, a particular memory to be, sto to be stored to be later retrieved. Memory effectively is a storage of information such that it can be accessed later on. And, and that process is thought to be due to changes in neurons signaling to each other. That information comes into the brain, that information might be visual, auditory, um, smell, touch, etc. And then that information will be passed, processed and passed through to higher level brain regions where it will be brought together to form what we could say a representation of information and it'll be stored in a way that we can later retrieve it hopefully assuming that it's a memory we can access. Of course one of the big questions is in a way what is a memory because a memory can be just a simple representation of a piece of information we might not even know we we have so to speak in memory or it can be a, kind of a piece of information we can readily retrieve. So the internet or, or networks of connection will, will retain information, but accessing that information and how you access that information has obviously got to be harnessed. So I guess you could argue that if, they, if, if you have an immense, an immense store of information, it can be coded in such a way that you can access that code from an individual at any one time, then that would be incredibly powerful. So if you just want to learn something about memory because you're interested in it, and suddenly you, you can somehow send a signal to a, a data bank which pulls out that information, then that yeah, we've done that before, yeah. We have ready access to information through the internet, which does two things. One, it, it gives us lots of information to memorise, so it might give us much richer memories and knowledge. It depends what we're calling memories here. If we're calling our general knowledge memories, which they are, of course, then it may well increase the amount of knowledge we retain, but also with the internet at our fingertips, basically on our mobile phones, etc., we maybe feel we don't need to hold on to such information. I think there was a quote from Einstein who basically said you don't need to remember, that's what libraries are for. You, you shouldn't, <laughs> there's no point remembering things just for the sake of remembering things. The important thing is to be able to use information uh, in order to guide your kind of understanding of something. It's, you, you, know, you need to know where to find the information, but having it all in your brain is, is not necessarily that useful. So you could argue, if you take it to the extreme, that if, if, if you can find a way to signal from the break, from the human, to send a signal to a, to a storage bank, I'll call it that, where, where you can retrieve information, then over many years that you, you would argue that the, the human brain's ability to, or needs to store information would, would dissipate because it can be accessed elsewhere. And I think the way that, that knowledge is changing and the way that people are trained at university level, in schools, wherever, it's going to be different now to the way it was before, simply because you, I mean, you can't remember everything. There's, and there's, every day there's more things to know. So it's, 
it's maybe this kind of reliance on accessing information now rather than storing information yourself is the way to go. Uh, it's basically because you're anaesthetizing your brain. <laughs> so the more you drink, the basically the alcohol will actually increase the inhibition in your brain and it's become harder for you to to recall memories because they're being you know, the whole central nervous system is being suppressed from the outside in. So eventually the cortex gets affected and eventually, you know, which is why eventually if you drink too much you stop breathing because the, those centers in your brain will eventually be turned off by alcohol. Um, it's sort of interesting, it kind of the flip side of that is sometimes you only remember things under certain conditions, uh, which is called state dependency. So if you're under the influence of some compound and something happens, you can sometimes you can encode that information. You can only retrieve it if you're in the same state. So sometimes people have you know you have to have a drink in order to remember something. People studied information deep down under underwater in the sea and uh, they could only retrieve the information as well when they were underwater again better than when they were on land so your physiological state as well as your environment affects your memory so that's one possible reason but another reason of course could be that when we are drunk um, we are, our, our brain systems aren't working efficiently so we don't have as good control for example over what we call the executive functions, our, our kind of organization and planning of memory. You can either have a problem with that memory disappearing, or you have a problem recalling that memory, and it's almost impossible to say what that problem is so if you can't if you don't have a memory is it because you can't recall it or is it gone forgotten memories might be forgotten because they've decayed again there's a lot of uh, debate and research uh, ongoing as to what does happen to memories such that we can't retrieve them as well later so perhaps they have decayed over time uh, perhaps they've been replaced with new information um, uh, um, uh, or, or affected through interference uh, so it's not that they go somewhere, forgotten memories. Um, it's that they're not perhaps represented in such a rich fashion that we can retrieve them. The way I would think about it from the, how, how memories are believed to be established is it's, it's an inability to access that memory rather than dropping something out of the brain. You know I mean, so the, so the network's probably there, but you've lost the ability to access it. So, okay. so they could potentially be... Brought back again in that argument, yeah. possibly. Yeah. That would be the, the follow-through from that. 